Now, it's David, starring David. <laughs> okay, let's start that one again from the top. Welcome, everybody. Uh, afternoon. Congratulations. We're halfway through the conference. We're still here. Well done, everybody. Uh, I'm going to give you a very quick uh, congratulations to Chris Patno, who's, who's pretty much had um, this seat engraved with him. This seat actually merges into him now. Um, and, of course, we're going to give him a hard time on this panel just to... because we want to. Um, this, this, this session is about artificial intelligence. And AI, artificial intelligence, and all the related terms, such as machine learning, uh, are probably one of the most discussed and most misunderstood technologies, uh, particularly when we talk about the impact on people with disabilities. It's probably the area which offers the greatest potential for changing lives, for enabling access, but I think for many of us, it's also possibly the area which carries some of the greatest risk. And with our panelists today, all of whom are either working with AI, three cases implementing AI into products, but also looking at it from some distance and trying to make sure that AI has a positive impact on people with disabilities. We're, we're gonna try and look at that balance I was uh, interviewing somebody related to AI recently, and he made a, a really interesting point. He said, you know, everybody knows that with artificial intelligence, we're each having to make compromises. We're having to decide what will we give up in order to get the benefits of AI. And for people with disabilities, says, that balance is not the same. It's different for us, because the potential benefit may outweigh the risks much more than it does for other people. So what that balance looks like for different parts of a society is quite challenging. And of course, when we talk about AI, this isn't future technology, this isn't emerging technology anymore. For many of us, AI is part of things we use every day. It's part of our phones, it's part of our tablets, our computers. When I go onto Netflix, it uses an AI algorithm to tell me what I'd like to watch next. When I go onto Amazon, it recommends products to me. It recognizes some, sometimes it recommends some really, really weird products. Um, and I'm sure that I didn't buy any of those. Um, but it is part of what is there for us. When we use captions, automatic captions in our conferences, it's AI that's driving that. And with that in mind, I really want to start off by trying to look at the bigger picture. Uh, and there's no bigger picture than what Google are doing. And within the Google, many Google products, we're gonna find artificial intelligence is built into there uh, and is part of what we're using. So I'm gonna ask Chris Patno really to kick off and help us set the scene with artificial intelligence. Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, artificial intelligence at Google is sort of the, the, the pixie dust that, that really we bring to a products that gives the ability to personalize, to make it interesting, to make it meaningful. Um, but I would love to have my, my presentation so I can talk through it. Brilliant, thank you. So, actually, no, I need my glasses. It's been one of those days, pardon me. So, at a super high level, for those people who don't think about AI, other than this, this, this scary thing that's supposed to take over the world when Arnold Schwarzenegger is, is a little bit younger, um, but what artificial intelligence really is, it's, it's the study and design of machines and, it, of, of, and algorithms that ap appear intelligent. They, they mimic human intellectual functions, I, I, and, they, and there's many ways of, of artificial intelligence being developed and being implemented. But, the, but in particular, the one I talk, I talk about mostly is, is machine learning, or, or ML. Um, because this is what I have the most experience with, and, and I'll be completely frank, I've been doing this for years and I use them interchangeably. They're not the same, but I use them interchangeably, and I probably will here today, so mea culpa. But it is so incredibly powerful. The ability to have a computer have contextualized information for you and present information for you and interact with you is remarkable, especially when it comes to assistive technology. They can help with communication support, like with our project Relate or Project Activate. These are, these are technologies that, that help people have a com who have 
but I'll let Voice to talk about this because they do a, they're doing an excellent job in this space. Um, we have a look to speak, which uses the camera to take a look at your face, and, and, and people who have who, um, different kinds of impairments, you could have a facial expression that can trigger uh, different kind of actions. Um, we have a live transcribe and notifications well, and live captions, well, which I'll talk about in just a moment, which help people who are deaf or hard of hearing communicate. We have action blocks and Lookout and, and even Google Translate. This is an interesting one. It's not one that people, many people consider assistive technology until you're in a foreign country where you don't speak the language. All of a sudden it becomes assistive. And then you have things like Lookout and Lens, which uses the computer vision and can describe the world or, or images on your screen around you. And then you have things like voice access and, and, and camera access, which allows you to use, use your voice or your face to manipulate your computer. All of these things are empowered with artificial intelligence, with machine learning. But what I want to talk about is specifically is automatic speech recognition. This is the magic that creates the, the captions on your phone, the magic that creates captions in Zoom or Google Meet. Um, so this is where I want to focus right now. Super, super high level how this works is that it takes raw audio data, the voice, and then it, it creates a visual representation for it and then recognizes it and labels it. Either if you're creating the, the model, you insert the labels so we know what it means, and then once it recognizes it, it, it applies that labels, puts it through a convol convolutional neural net, and through that we create this real-time transcription. And what does that mean? Well, it means captions, and, and captions are for me with the largest curb cut when it comes to accessibility but also one of the most powerful and impactful things that, that is exploding in, in, in the, the technology today. It started in 2009 on YouTube when YouTube had the first English automatic captions. In all honesty, they weren't that great. But what we realized is not that great is, is a whole heck of a lot better than nothing. And this, this brought us onto that path that really, where you realize that you, perfection can never be the goal. You always have to improve. You always have to make these things better. And now the, 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 the error rate is, is remarkably low. And now we have 13 different languages that we can provide automatic captions for on YouTube. In 2016, out of a hackathon, two people added captions into Google Slides and Google Hangouts. And this convert, got converted into Google Meet, where we were the first company that provided free captions for everybody in English. And now we have captions in multiple languages, and we have even have the ability to translate from English into other languages. So these, these machine learning tools can, can help people understand themselves, the computer, their, their community, and their business around. But when you make it mobile, when you start integrating with the real world, that's when things really get interesting. We have a fantastic application called Live Transcribe and Sound Notifications. It can provide real-time transcription, real transcription for order eight. I've, I'm talking a lot today. <laughs> Real-time transcription for over 80 languages. And it also allows you, if you choose or cannot to respond, to respond to text. So it pr provides a real opportunity for, for hu real human interaction. This is developed in conjunction with the community. We developed it with, with great cooperation with our friends at Gallaudet at University. But then we realized situation awareness is also quite important. So then we started adding the ability to have your phone tell you when your name is being called. We can flash the light or kick off a haptic. Or we can even tell you when things like your microwave is going off, or a baby is crying, or there's an alarm. So adding situational awareness wherever you are becomes really important. It's a very powerful addition to this application. But then, when you realize that you have this application, you want to expand it. So we realize we have captions. OK, but what else can you caption? So we later added a thing called live caption, which captions any audio source on, on your, almost any audio source on your phone. And then we took that one step farther into bringing captions into phone calls. And I'd like to sort of share with you a couple seconds of what this can mean. People think, if I got a hearing aid on, I could hear everything. And that's not true. I live, read, most of the time. I have two boys, and they're both a very important part of my life. This is Matthew's youngest son. Hi, I'm Harry. He lives in Hong Kong and plays rugby. I always want to keep in touch with him. Before, I need to communicate with him through Zoom or WhatsApp. I would try and lip read him, but it's really hard because it's not 3D, it's a flat screen. When I got the Google Peter phone, I could fly a Captain Peter. Harry was the first person I phoned. It was incredible. And we were talking for about half an hour 
all of a sudden, he said... Dad, do you realise this is the first time we've talked on the phone? I would speechly for three, four seconds, and it realised what it really meant. I'm 55 years old, and for the first time in my life, I was able to call my son. So the opportunity to connect people to the world around them, to their work, is huge. Giving a man an opportunity to speak to his son for the first time on the phone ever is powerful. This is the magic, this is the impact that, that assistive technologies based on artificial intelligence and machine learning can bring. And that's why we're so excited. Thank you, Chris. That's a great example. I've always been a firm believer that we need data, we need research, and it's really important for our work. But equally, stories have power, and stories are important to be shared because they're what make the data human. Um, I want to just move on for a moment because one of the first people I remember talking to about AI was Klaus Hockner, um, and this is about four, about four years ago, I think now. Um, and he managed to both uh, infuse me about the potential and terrify me in the space of about 30 seconds as we talked about it. And I, I thought he would be a, a great speaker for this session to really start to explore that balance between the great stories, the benefits, and some of the things that we need to be wary about as we move ahead. Klaus. Thank you very much. Can I have my slides? Yes. There are two important uh, things on, on, on the first slide uh, which, uh, which I would like to mention. The first thing is DPO. I'm a representative from a disabled persons organization uh, from the HBS, HGBS, the Hilfsgemeinschaft der Blinden und Sehschwachen Österreichs. That's a blind organi organization representing blind and visual impaired persons. Uh, and that's the second point of view, uh, <clears throat> which is very important uh, to see it from the perspective of a blind person or a visual impaired person. Uh, the, and the, thir the third thing is the practical usage of artificial intelligence. Uh, I go over the slides with, with the description of my, uh, of my person, uh, and I will ask you two questions. Uh, would it be possible for a blind person to drive a car without assistance in the future? Yeah? You go out, uh, well, you, you, you wake up in the morning and say, okay, I, I, I need some rolls or I need something to eat, blah, 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 yeah? Uh, and I start calling my, my car, the car will come down to, to, my, uh, to the entrance of my house, I will go into the car, I will go to the supermarket. At, at the supermarket, I pre-ordered all the things that I need. Yeah? Uh, they will come out, they bring it to my car, and the car is going home, let me out, and seeking for a parking space then. Yeah? Should it, be it could be possible, why not? Yeah? Yeah? By means of AI. Yeah? And the other thing is, uh, and I know some, some, there will be some great objections against it, do we need proper WCAG 2.A3 blah 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 programming of a website? Because AI can repair it. Yeah? We now have this overlay discussion, for example, in, in, in the United States on, and in, Euro, in Europe, uh, uh, where there are big, uh, big, big, um, no, not big. The people are afraid that when they have overlay, then uh, accessibility will not be taken into account by programming a website or programming an app or, or, or something like that. Yeah, uh, but could AI help us to make a website accessible according to all rules, according to standards, uh, <clears throat> and I don't have to care about it because I can program my website uh, mm -hmm. as I like it and as I can do it? I don't know. Huh? Uh, but that's the question that we have to ask. And it's also about all the other things that are connected with AI. It's about IoT, it's about all this smart, smart city, smart home, smart business, smart blah, 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 and so on. And we have to be aware, uh, we are speaking about 30 billions of items now connected in the internet, yeah? Uh, and there is <coughs> a forecast that says that in 2020, 
five, we have seven, oh, my, I need better glasses, uh, seven, 75 billions, yeah. <laughs> and all these things should be interconnected uh, via AI, yeah? uh, because when I have a smart home, there is this, there is this joke, and uh, I've seen this movie with this guy from the Netherlands who has a smart home, uh, and it opens the door by his voice. And then he went to the dentist, and he was locked out. Because it doesn't, uh, the, the home doesn't recognize his voice because he was speaking uh, with a voice disorder then. You know? Uh, or there's this, this joke with the, with the guys from, from Scotland uh, being in an elevator. Eleven. Eleven, yeah. And, <laughs> and they can't get out anymore. <coughs> because uh, it even doesn't it open the door. Yeah? Uh, because it doesn't recognize the, the, uh, the dialect. Yeah? So let me, let me say it uh, clear. Uh, I don't see only the dangers, and I don't see only the, the uh, only the pros of uh, uh, of AI. And AI is not a revolutionary game changer, as it is mentioned sometimes, and it's not a very new thing. We you know uh, it exists since decades. Yeah? Now we have other machines. Now we have storage. Uh, uh, the computers are faster. Uh, and all this stuff, so all this machine learning uh, algorithm uh, can work in a better way, faster, and so on. I remember when I was in uh, the university in the 1990s, oh, 30 years ago, yeah, uh, here in Vienna, we had this neural networks and all this stuff. Yeah? And that's also uh, and, and the machine learning stuff. Yeah? And they, they said us, okay, that it will last least 50, 60 years uh, that we are able to process all these stuff. And I don't think that this, that this was true. Uh, but uh, we also, we have a lot of things before us, uh, before we can use uh, artificial intelligence in the way that all people are benefiting for it, from it. Uh, the possible fields that I can see uh, in artificial intelligence, and there are some things to discuss uh, in my list. Yeah, uh, the re-engineering, as I said, it, to make it wake up, wake up. Now it's wake up. Perhaps in the future we have another one, another uh, standard. Yeah, automated captioning. Uh, <clears throat> when you work with Zoom or Teams or whatever, yeah, uh, then you can see that automated captioning. For example, today I had a, a, I had a session. Uh, where I had this automated captioning uh, for English in Zoom, uh, and Zoom located me to Australia. Every time when I said, I'm from Austria, it was just Australia, yeah? <clears throat> so, it has to be more accurate, yeah? One of the big points is sign language avatars. Can we use sign language avatars in a way uh, that, they are, that the people with uh, hearing impairments can, uh, can use them uh, in a way as they are used now uh, for persons. Yeah? Automated alt text is for pictures. This is one of, of, of the very crucial points for blind persons. Yeah? Uh, the alternative text, <coughs> uh, we are discussing since 10 or 15 years within the community, how is an alternative text, how long is an alternative text, and what is the content of, of an alternative text? What we have to describe? Do we describe only that we see, for example, a talking face now, like here, yeah? Or do we describe who is the person? Uh, is this person uh, from Europe? Uh, has, has the person black hair, so blah, 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 yeah? Is it necessary to, dis to, uh, to describe all these things? <clears throat> Automated audio description is the next thing. Uh, what are we describing? We are describing uh, the background, we are describing the scene, or we are describing what is going on. Uh, and 
I can't see now at the moment that uh, automated audio description uh, comes up to uh, to a real to the real things. Yeah. Then, as I mentioned before, all the things around smart, the smart homes, the smart city, the smart work, blah blah blah, uh, in connection with all the self-driving things, self-driving cars, buses, drones, <coughs> and could a blind person drive a car? I asked before. Yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah, uh, but. Insurance companies are clapping in their hands when they hear about self-driving cars for blind persons. Yeah. Uh, they, they want, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, care robots, supporting robots, all these stuff that we have around. And this list is not finished. We can, I think, add 20, 30 more points on it, yeah. <clears throat> what, is the real, uh, what is the real important thing there? Yeah. Yes. Artificial intelligence can help us. And artificial intelligence can support us uh, in the way that persons with disabilities can benefit from all the things that artificial intelligence can provide for us. But, there is the but, there are some preconditions. One of the most important things for me is trustworthiness. Trustworthiness uh, <clears throat> means uh, you you trust when you when you uh, when you go into an airplane uh, that this airplane won't crash. <clears throat> the same thing I would expect uh, when when I'm using an AI system, uh, that the outcome is that what I want. That is the, that the outcome that the outcome is. I would like to have oversight on the data. Uh, which of my data uh, is used for producing an output? In, uh, in artificial intelligence, that means <clears throat> no black boxing. Yes, and we are in Europe, <laughs> GDPR. GDPR compliance is also one of the things that uh, are for me very uh, important. Affordability, that's the thing for David. He always says uh, all the, the tools and uh, assistive technologies that we are using have to be affordable, yeah? And that's true, uh, because <clears throat> if they are not paid by state, uh, where did we get the money from? Where do we get the money from? Yeah? Uh, and the other thing, uh, it sounds ridiculous, but accessibility, yeah? The things have to be accessible, the simple, basic, accessible preconditions have to be taken into account by uh, producing or from the scratch. You have to involve persons with disabilities, you have to involve the users in the design phase, in the product, in the whole chain of production uh, from products and services when designing services and products with uh, artificial intelligence inbuilt. <clears throat> yes, and the buyers. The last thing, but the most important thing is the bias. Yeah? How can we uh, make it more, how, how can we more make it more just? Yeah? Uh, the <clears throat> we know, we all know uh, that there is a big dis ongoing discussion uh, in, in the AI community and not only in the AI community that we only can <clears throat> come over this peak of the bias when we have more data. But I don't think that uh, more data means uh, that, that, that the data will be, re will represent <clears throat> more uh, the, 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 uh, the, the whole society. Yeah? Uh, we had, for example, a big uh, discussions in this, in this group uh, on artificial intelligence, in the high level group on artificial intelligence, uh, uh, in the, in the Commission of the European Union, uh, where they said, <clears throat> okay, uh, for artificial intelligence, we don't need GDPR. No? Sec G GDPR, no? then we have the data, and all will be, all will be better for all persons. No? And the other thing was, for example, the car industry, they, had, uh, they said, okay, um, <clears throat> we need a legal obligation for self-driving cars all over the world, because then uh, we can uh, say not 400 persons dying are dying in the every year uh, by car accidents, uh, and only 10 persons will die. Yeah? 
I don't know uh, if it's true, yeah? uh, but I don't think that uh, we, we should have a legal obligation for, for artificial intelligence. And now I'm open for discussions. Okay, thank you very much, Klaus. Um, one of the things that, you know, listening to Chris and, and Klaus is that they're often talking about technologies that are developed for everyone, and through AI, hopefully, they're inclusive of people with disabilities. Uh, and there's some really interesting challenges with that. I, I remember being uh, talking to somebody who was talking about how an AI had been developed which was used to analyze video on subway platforms. And what it did uh, is it watched the movements of people as they walked along the platform waiting for a train and could highlight to the people working at the station if someone's movements were sufficiently out of the ordinary pattern to suggest they were about to jump in front of a train. And a member of the staff could be sent down and as a train approached, could stand next to the person and make sure they didn't suddenly make a movement then towards the rails. That sounds really interesting. It sounds like an incredibly positive thing to be able to do to save someone's life. Except some of those movements were very similar to the way people with autism wait for a train. They move around, they shift, they're unusual. So the outliers in the information, the people who don't fit the pattern, may find that the AI is misrepresenting their intentions. So we have this big challenge as we look at AI across big tech, across the big technologies that are being built. But it's interesting then to think about whether or not those same issues emerge for those companies who are starting to apply AI very, very specifically to the needs of people with disabilities. And our next three speakers are really going to give us a hard, concrete example of how AI is making a difference at that very granular level. And I'm really pleased to start with Sarah. And anybody who was at the Austrian Parliament uh, the other day uh, would have been blown away by your presentation, um, which I thought was very, very unfair because uh, it means I couldn't take the benefit of having you here and saying, yeah, it was my idea. Um, so having said that, uh, I'm, I'm really, really pleased to have you on the panel. Sarah, please, uh, take it from here. Thank you so much, and it's really an honor to be here on this panel and participating in this event as well, so thank you so much. Um, so I'm Sarah, I'm one of the co-founders of Voiceit. We are an Israel-based uh, startup, and I'm excited to be here to kind of give you um, a bit of a sense of what's going on behind the scenes of a startup with a particular challenge, not just in um, building AI, but specifically in the assistive technology space, which, as I think a lot of you um, can imagine and relate to, has particular challenges, multi-dimensional um, as well. But, you know, like, um, really like any, any AI um, or anything being built, um, AI too starts from a human um, perspective and from a, a really human place. So I thought I would really start from there. Um, Voice It started from a personal experience. Um, and in my case, it was my grandmother diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. It was early onset, uh, age 40. So you can see on the screen, um, those of you here and those online, I'm the little girl in the red dress, still generally have uh, curly hair. Um, and of course, you know, even as a young child, I could feel her um, pain and frustration because it was often so difficult for her to communicate even basic human needs, um, you know, like I'm thirsty or it's cold, because at that stage of the disease, um, her motor impairments um, um, specifically affected her speech. Um, and of course, this is um, a situation that is 
much more wide ranging and has been part of our experience um, in um, starting this company in the diversity of underlying conditions and disorders, disabilities affecting speech. And that was really our inspiration to leverage the best of AI and, to, and voice technologies to help people with speech impairments to communicate with others and be understood uh, using their voices. What's interesting is that we, um, the idea for leveraging the technology actually came from observing the experiences of people. And, um, and this was particularly in the case of our founder, my co-founder and CEO, Danny, whose family member had a stroke. And what he observed is that the people close, well, well you know, she had, was, had a very hard time being understood by most unfamiliar listeners. He saw that she could be understood by the people closest to her, generally caregivers that were with her all, all the time. Because of course what had happened is that they were exposed enough to her voice that um, they started to um, be able to understand her speech patterns. And we realized, well, if humans can do it, then, um, then technologies can do the same using machine learning mechanisms as they essentially continue to learn and adapt, um, collecting more data um, on the person's speech. So essentially, our machine learning mechanisms are going to work the same way as they collect data on the specific person and then on the commonalities between people with similar conditions. So that's what we did and that was our inspiration. Um, we developed a technology, um, automatic speech recognition, um, which like most speech recognition systems rely on a combination of um, AI and machine learning um, to s specifically recognize someone with non-standard speech. Um, our first product is a mobile application. Um, so we released it uh, last year, um, so kind of during the pandemic on the App Store. Um, so it's an iOS device, it's an uh, iOS application, so um, iPhones or iPads sometimes, you know, mounted on a wheelchair if the user is using a wheelchair. And like our original inspiration, um, the idea was that the person can train the software um, uh, following some a few prompts on the screen and then it be able to use it essentially as a translator tool to be able to communicate with those around them. Um, to say, to, to communicate a need, you know, I'm in pain to a caregiver or, you know, to a medical professional to order a coffee in a coffee shop, or simply to say, I love you um, to a loved one. So we launched this application. We've done beta programs with partners around the world um, and, and with close feedback from, um, from partners, end users, families, and the many you know, kind of multiple stakeholders um, uh, who, um, in, you know, around the individual as well. And what we learned is that, you know, this first, you know, original idea of enabling someone to communicate with others and be understood was empowering and potentially transformative. But now, in a world that's increasingly voice enabled, um, we realized we could do a lot more. Um, we could help people talk to their machines. And so that's what we started to explore. What would it be like if a speech enabled, um, if, if a, someone with a non atypical speech pattern could use their voice to be able to access any of the technologies that all of us are essentially able to access and benefit from. Um, many people who have a, um, a speech impairment may also um, experience other challenges, whether it's cognitive or mobility or dexterity impairments. And of course, voice technology has the potential to provide a whole new dimension of independence um, if the person can access uh, these, these voice technologies. And so that really became our vision um, and our goal. So that's, essentially what we started to explore. 
and um, on the International Day of Disabilities 2020, so smack in the middle of the pandemic, we announced our first um, uh, exploration, integrating voice it, um, technology with another mainstream um, voice tech. Um, and I'll show you um, how that worked, was our integration with Amazon Alexa. Cool. Hello, I'm Wendy. And, and this, this is, is our life with voices. They develop this wonderful thing which you will see Alexa like that. Okay. You have no idea on how many doors you're going to be opening for so many people. Alexa, keep me off. Like I said, you have no idea how much this means, Sam. No idea. We waited for this for so long, and we thought that this would never happen. Okay. This is such a wonderful gift in so many ways. Thank you. So I'll just, I'll take one step back um, just for a moment, um, just to... Uh, Sarah, can I, can I ask you to sort of move move, through a move, little bit more quickly? On, yeah. uh, time is uh, getting away from us already. Uh, of course, of course. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of conclude with um, our, one of our, really our key learnings um, as a startup is that you know, one of the themes, I think, of this conference is that as we're building um, inclusive, AI-driven um, machine learning, you know, innovative technologies, all, all of us here either building or being involved in this tech, um, of course, we're, um, it's so important to um, include um, the end users and those stakeholders in the development. But at the same time, as a startup, we're also um, so um, intent on involving the community as well, and that's um, both end users and 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 that and families and clinical professionals and therapists, but also um, in uh, investors and um, and and corporates involved in similar technologies, um, government and and policymakers that I think at the end of the day are all in collaboration, um, essential to um, ensuring that these technologies, you know, are, um, uh, can be built and then um, getting into the hands of the people that um, can benefit from it the most. Thank you very much. And it, it's interesting what we're starting to see emerging in this discussion. We start with issues of how AI and machine learning predicts and anticipates. It recognizes patterns and helps us to make decisions based on that. But it goes further than that from what we're hearing, particularly from what we're hearing from Sarah, that actually what it begins to do is to transform data. And I think Chris touched upon this as well. And by data, we don't mean numbers. We mean voices. We mean what people are saying, what people are saying, seeing, and transforming that into other formats that gives us access and accessibility. And Klaus, quite rightly, even at this early stage, started to flag up, what does that mean when we talk about universal design, when we talk about website design? And it's with that, those thoughts in mind that really I want to turn to Paul, because one of the things that that really begins to draw us upon is what Paul's been working on, which is really is around clarification, about the importance of clarity of information for people to make decisions. And Paul, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing. Yes, I will, thank you. The slides, please, that would be nice. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Paul, I'm the CDO of Capito, and we're talking about easy to read, easy language, as I call it in this presentation. 
Um, well, actually, Capito is not a startup in this sense of definition that we all know. We are doing this for 20 years already. So we have done thousands and thousands of projects. But thousands of projects in the German-speaking countries are just a drop in the ocean when it comes to understandability. Everything should be understandable. We were talking about human care robots, about self-driving cars. And I think if they're not understandable to the customers and the users, what sense do they make? So this is what we're trying to do. We have all this data out of 20 years of work. And now we want to scale it up. And this it makes sense for Capito, because we have a system and a business model already that creates something we call a data value chain. So we have these thousands of projects. We have parallel data, so we know our data. This is the complicated text version. This is the easy to read text version. That's a very good setting to start with. It's already labeled for those who are engaged in AI. That's a very good setting to start with training transformer models and all these higher complicated AI models. But what is very important, we also have humans who give feedback on each and every text that we produce in the analog sector. So every training data we use is already at least double checked by people representing the target group and professional editors. So that's something I want to emphasize on because you shouldn't do AI if you do not have a good condition in your company already, if you do not have the access to data. And that's a warning because it's a buzzword AI and each and every company should think about the situation if they're actually in a position to start engaging in this kind of very expensive, very risky sort of development. As we have this situation, we found already plenty of partners who support us. We have something I would call a data circle or a data trust. We collect data from a lot of development partners. And as we're in this good position, this Swiss state joined us, for instance, in one of the biggest scientific fundings they ever gave out. The European Commission joined our mission, so to say, and elected us out of 7,000 companies to be one of the EIC accelerator. And of course, the Austrian research and development agencies also support us, which we're very thankful for. But the reason we got all these fundings and all these partners coming to us is that we strongly engage in a network attempt and that we try to you know, spread it out and cooperate with whoever helps us and helps our mission. Um, and of course, there are results. We had been a social business for 20 years, but we are kind of in the startup business, so we need to show results fastly. This is an assistant technology where, which is analyzing already your and the understandability of your text. And as we have had this a couple of times during this conference, of course, this kind of assistance who helps you to create easy to understand text is available per API. So you can integrate it into other technology or in, uh, on AI marketplaces. And yeah, we're at the beginning of our journey. We're doing this for German. And we start releasing things for English, French, Spanish, and Italian in the next couple of years. And hopefully, sooner or later, everything will be understandable. Thank you. That's pretty much for my side. Thank you very much, Paul. That's very, very, very helpful. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing how these technologies are really pervading into so many different areas for the future. Um, and I was, I was, as I said earlier, I was doing a little bit of background work for this. Uh, and I, I was very fortunate to come across uh, Alana AI uh, and ne Nehat who's going to be our final speaker. And it's very interesting for me. Two of the best products of the last two or three years that I've seen um, were Be My Eyes and Seeing AI. And it always struck me as I watched those two products and what they did, at what point would much of the work that Be My Eyes and its volunteers be possible through a camera and AI. Um, and it, I was reminded of that thought when I first spoke to Nehat. And Nehat, over to you. I'd, I'd like to tell everybody more about the work you're doing. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, important event. Um, if you could share the slides, please. Um, I'm Nehat Krasniki. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Alana AI. 
I'll start off with a bit of background about the company and then I'll move on to what we are trying to achieve with the Royal Institute for the Blind and, uh, and, and our, our uh, machine learning models that we've got within, within the company. So uh, Alana is a Harriet Watt University uh, spin-out company. Uh, we combined the latest research in AI to tackle real-life use cases, uh, combined with 120 years of experience in NLP, machine learning, and linguistics. Uh, the team is led by Professor Oliver Lemon, uh, who's a world-renowned scientist um, in this space. Um, we were twice finalists in the Amazon Alexa competition, um, and uh, today I'll be presenting to you our companion product uh, that we're building in partnership with the Royal Institute for the Blind, as I mentioned. Um, and the essence of the product is basically putting the needs of the blind and partially sighted people right at the forefront of the design and the user experience that we are, we are building. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, technology, where we are is, uh, as a company is a, a very, very much a deep tech company that's pushing the boundaries of the, all the machine learning models that we've got uh, in, in the world and, and, and dif the different research uh, facilities both within the big four companies as well as other tech companies and uh, we're looking at all of that to basically combine uh, 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 the technology to, com to, to put together contextual relevant AI companions that have the ability to, uh, you have, will have the ability to con uh, speak to um, uh, similar to what the, some of the projects we mentioned here in, in this project, in this panel, sorry. Uh, but also text uh, for obviously non um, uh, for, for the general users, um, and also combined vision uh, as well. So we're pioneering a more effective approach to the current market options, combining computer vision with state-of-the-art conversational AI technology. Um, Alana initially will support blind and partially sighted people uh, in an indoor environment, 24/7. So we will deliver companions that can talk to the users about multiple topics um, in, in, in a very much companion style uh, 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 environment where the user can have someone to talk to. The, the, the study shows from the work that we're doing with the Royal Institute for the Blind is aside from the, obviously the, the obvious visual impairment, the, the biggest issue is isolation. And having somebody to talk to is a really, really important uh, aspect of, of, of what we are doing here in, in, in this panel and, and the companies pre represented here. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, where we are taking the technology in, 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 and the real impacts uh, that we are focusing on as a business, is uh, there's a couple of elements which, which I wanted to highlight. Number one is the ability to search over context, uh, which means over multiple turns and understanding the context of what the topic or the relevant topic that you're speaking about to provide the user which, with a much more uh, enhanced and also grounded uh, information sources so that the user feels that uh, the, the AI is actually you know, providing useful information which actually is secure as well, which, is, which I want to highlight. The second element is uh, the visual uh, in interpreter which you've seen with uh, Google Lookout and, and, and so on. Uh, we're combining visual, uh, uh, computer vision with dialogue to cr create a much more human-like interaction for the user. So Alana, um, uh, and the third point, which I wanted to uh, highlight with, with Sarah's point as well, which, which I think which her work is fantastic, by the way. Um, Alana's current state-of-the-art uh, NLU, uh, which is natural language understanding models, allows for the users to have a much more interactive uh, um, conversation with a machine. Uh, and what I mean by that is that effectively you have people with speech impediments, with fluencies in the way that we say, or just changing the sentence as, as, you, as you communicate with, 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 uh, with information or data sources and, and so on. Um, uh, so in terms, of, in terms of the impact that, that Alana is, 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 will have to, to well, I guess, the, the blind and partially sighted uh, community, um, it, it's, it's going to have the ability to have multi-topic uh, conversations uh, uh, and, and obviously uh, with that you'll reduce loneliness. The visual component is, is unlike anything that's available in the market right now. You have, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Ira and Google and uh, Google Lookout and so on, but they all require, apart from Google Lookout, Chris, <laughs> uh, uh, they all ha require some sort of human intervention. We want to reduce that as much as possible to offer a much more independent living for the blind and partially sighted people. So they have something to talk to. They can uh, they can use the phone uh, back of the phone of the camera, which is about you know providing to this to the millions of people around the world that that need this technology. 
Um, uh, but also the, the final point is, is, is identifying uh, uh, use cases with the Royal Institute for the Blind that are actually meaningful, and, 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 and we're trying to uh, push the boundaries when it, when it comes to that. Um, uh, um, I guess uh, the, the final points um, on this is that we are in uh, the process of launching our meaningful viable product. We're slightly behind the rest of the team here <laughs> on this panel. Um, we are uh, due to launch to a, a, a closed focus group uh, of, of, uh, of RNIB, for, sorry, for the RNIB community, uh, which will encompass some of the Alana's features, which is search, uh, uh, object detection. Uh, further on, uh, later in the year, we will uh, have a much wider uh, 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 array using, you know, uh, more advanced technology, especially combining, you know, uh, things like LiDAR and so on. Uh, I'll move on quickly. I'm conscious of time. On to the next slide, if I thing is working. In terms of uh, funding and what we've done so far, we've been very lucky to be backed by some amazing uh, uh, shareholders. Uh, we were recently uh, uh, successful in a, uh, in a European Horizon 2020 grant, uh, which is part of uh, a consortium that the, the successful bid was at eight and a half million euros. Alana is part of that. Unfortunately, it's not getting all of it, <laughs> uh, which would help. Uh, uh, and uh, that's specifically focused towards uh, strokes, Sarah. And I'd love to have a conversation about that as well with you after this. Um, and I guess in terms of challenges, like we mentioned here, data, privacy, how we deal with that. Um, I mean, Alana's uh, um, will not only listen uh, to, to the users, but would also our vision is to combine, as I mentioned earlier, dialogue and vision, so we'll actually see what the surroundings are and what that means for the user, but also the third party. And trying to, uh, you know, get out, get 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 around that is 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 you know not not an easy task. But we're we're you know certain, certainly taking small footsteps. And uh, my final comments: please uh, visit our website to keep be kept informed and uh, follow us on uh, on Twitter. Hello, Alana. That's it from me. Thanks so much, Manad. I mean, there is so much there to take on board. <laughs> but the idea that loneliness, one of the most disabling conditions that we can all experience, that part of that and part of the way we address that in the future is through artificial intelligence, through conversational AI, is something which for me was something I had never imagined before I heard and had my conversation in Nahad. But Chris, I know you, you wanted to add something to this. Yeah, I, I, for those people who were unfortunate enough to hear me in previous panels, there's something that I, I'd like to say is that it, there's a place for everyone to, to be working on, t on similar technologies. There's never going to be a single solution. Google may be doing something in, in multiple areas, but that doesn't mean we will do it the best. New ideas, new algorithms, new ways of approaching problems is really important. So I'm, I, even though I sit here representing Google, who does similar kinds of things, I want to say it's tremendously important that we have the voices and, and, and the Alanas to, to push the edge, to partner with and, and, and create solutions that haven't existed. And what I'm excited to see is if there's the opportunities to work together, we can sort of accelerate all of our work together to, for the sake of the common people, the, the common communities that we want to work with. And if I just, if I could quickly add, David, um, I want to extend my thanks to Chris, who's been super, super supportive throughout uh, our, you know, initiation scoping sessions uh, that we've had, and he's been tremendous in, throughout the process. So just thank you, uh, in public. Thank you so much. I want to. I, I mean, some of this stuff really excites me, and that's so sad. Um, you know. I'm a Manchester City fan. I haven't been this excited since 2012. I tell you, this has been great. Um, but I really want to... So on the, the theme of excitement, I want to sort of say to our panel, and Sarah, I'm going to start with you, because um, I can't see you. Uh, yeah, you are still there. Good, okay. So when you think about AI and the future, what excites you about the potential of what we might do? Um, wow, yeah, and I have to agree with you. Um, I'm also um, really excited. I think just um, as we all keep saying again and again, the world has changed, and, um, but there's so much, I think, that we've, we've um, learned over the past year or so. Um, what excites us, really, um, I think the most is um, in the future, in this field, in combining assistive technology and artificial intelligence, is that um, we're 
not just focusing on building, you know, special devices or special technologies that are for, you know, a, a certain group of people, but the potential for, um, for the combination of these new technologies to make mainstream tech um, truly accessible. That, 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 yeah, I think there's, you're absolutely right. What, what AI might actually mean that universal becomes universal. Maybe, we'll see. And maybe with that thought in mind, Klaus, Chris, would you add anything on, uh, into that area from your thinking? Yeah, Klaus, go. <clears throat> I think there will not be the, the one and only solution. Yeah? We have to combine all these all, all these solutions together. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, there, there are so many things on the market now, for example, for blind and visually impaired persons. When I, I look to Orchem, for example, or to Envision Glasses, where you can read out loud things. Uh, uh, which are GDPR compliant or not GDPR compliant, well, one, the one solution is in the internet, the one other solution is not in the internet. I, I've heard about other things, for example, for speech, uh, uh, for, for, for a person with a, a speech disorder, for example, there's, there's a company from Africa, uh, what, what was the name, uh, Euphoria or Euphoria or something like that, yeah. Uh, but <coughs> the, the thing is, uh, we, we have to mainstream it. As you said it before, uh, uh, we don't have to uh, to design for a specific group of disabled persons. Uh, we have to mainstream it. You have to mainstream it, to bring it in in a device like like this device. Uh, uh, it's it's like uh, Apple with the iPhone. Ninety-five percent percent of the per of blind persons that I know, which are <coughs> using an, an, uh, a smartphone, are using the iPhone but it was not created for persons uh, with visual impairment. Yeah? It was created as a gadget, as an add-on, as a super thing that you can use uh, to, to play with and, and, and so on. Yeah? Uh, don't, don't create it as a, as, a, as a special solution for a single uh, restricted uh, group of persons. Bring it into the mainstream, bring it into the uh, into the, uh, into the most used apps or devices that we have, for example, a smartphone. And Paul, did you want to add something? I think I saw, I think I saw some fingers waving down at that end. Yes, actually, I, w I would like to add something there. When we're talking about you know, combining products, combining services, upstream in the development process, we <coughs> first need to combine data. We need to learn how to manage data in a decent way yeah. that large companies and small companies can join forces in the development, because AI is data and it's still just data. And before we do not have the, the right legal environment, the right mindset in the heads of decision makers, you know, we can dream of good solutions and combined solutions and a smartphone that can do everything. But first of all, we need to do our homework and change a bit on how we work with our data, how we share it, how we can trust each other mm. working with data. And, and, and I think this is, this is really important because I, I want to just take that a little bit further if I can, which is you know, how, what advice can we give to people with disabilities who are nervous about what is being done with their data? And I, I want to turn to Nehat first on this one because we, you and I had a discussion about almost what I would call tonal analysis of AI. That when you speak, if you're trying to address that loneliness issue, at what point could AI begin to recognize the tone of voice? And a little bit like my example of the person with the movements on the subway platform, what if it could recognize from the tone and the words you were using that you were depressed, that you were stressed, that you were anxious, and what? You've been having to think a lot about these issues of privacy, in a, what could be a very, very difficult situation. Sure, um, I just wanted to highlight, I guess from a technical perspective, Alana is the brains, it's not the mouth and the ears. So we don't, we don't uh, work in the AR, ASR space, we rely on Google's ASR, for example. Uh, which which uh, there are methods now to understand the tone of the voice in order to understand the, the, uh, the, the mood of the person, if that makes sense. There, there is research uh, being 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 developed in that space, I guess from a from a from a from a more um, uh, data driven perspective, um, Alana um, uh, will try and manage the, the situation to the to the best of its ability. When somebody's saying I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling <coughs> stressed, I'm you know all the negative connotations you could have, 
Um, but um, uh, Alana will then, uh, uh, you know, at some point uh, uh, give in, if that makes sense. We're not pushing the boundaries uh, uh, in terms of handling, I guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, cognitive conditions from, uh, from that perspective. Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of data, it's really, really difficult. I completely resonate with everything you said. I think Alana operates in a space where uh, it's a, you know, it offers multi-turn, open domain question and answering, which you know, there is open uh, source information out there, and we've heard, I'm sure, of, of, of models of, like GTP3 and GPT, GPT2, um, uh, but unfortunately those models don't offer grounded contextual conversation, and that's the difference that Alana brings to the table. Um, and uh, so from, from, from our perspective, uh, you know, we, ha we, we, we find it easier, I guess, permission, and I think from my perspective as well, from the conversations I've had with RNIB and, the, and, and, and their community is that there is, there is a leniency towards, uh, you know, I, I think smaller companies uh, uh, to, to be given access to data, if that makes sense. Um, uh, a, lot dip, a lot harder for, uh, <laughs> for the large corporates, simply because uh, of the, some of the issues we've had uh, with AI and how it's being perceived from, you know, and, and some of the mistreatments we've had from AI. But I think we need to, as a community, drive the, the positive messages uh, in what AI and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and what this technology can do for so many conditions. And I think that, that, that there, there's a, almost a, I'm sure, I'm not sure what, what Chris would have to say about this, but there is a balance between uh, and, and know, I think that privacy question of balance and, is critical. And, 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 and actually given access because it's going to do yeah. more good than harm, if that makes sense. And I, I want to turn to Chris because I think you, you sort of touched upon, talked about Google. And for all of these, these big, big technology companies who pervade so much of our life because of the benefits they bring, the, some of these issues are absolutely at the heart of where they go from here. And Chris, I mean, from Google's perspective, from your own personal perspective, this issue of data privacy, security, safety, must be something which is a constant that you're thinking about. What, what would you, you say? I think the, the, the answer is you're never gonna have a blanket solution that meets everyone's needs in terms of privacy, security. So it's up to a platform company like Google to, to provide options that give people the ability to dial in the comfort with privacy, the comfort with security, because as, as Klaus said, there is a huge opportunity to, to do more, or maybe I was perhaps with you, I'm sorry. The, there, there is a, a, a balance in terms of privacy and, and ability. Mm. If we, the more we can know about you, the more helpful we can become. But not everybody wants that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't build it. We should allow people to, 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 to configure the experience based off their needs, their desires, their expectations. So it takes a little longer to, to create such a robust system of, 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 of controls, but it has to be done because it's, it's too important to not do it just because it's hard. Yeah. And that, that takes us to an area that, you know, as AI does pervade into our lives for our benefit, one of the big issues of that is how do we ensure informed consent to what is done with our data, what is done with the information that we're sharing into the systems? Because what we do know is that things improve with more data. That, you know, when we talked about things like automatic captions, three years ago, Chris said, not that great. Nowadays, because of the amount of use and repair and repetition, much, much better. So we, we need people's engagement. And the, really, I, my, my final question for you all, really, before we, we finish today, is how do we ensure, how do we engage people with disabilities into this process of the development of AI? Because there's one really weird thing that's going on here. We talk about nothing about us without us. This will happen whether you get engaged or not. This is going to happen. And people with disabilities and their representative organizations have got to engage with this process if they want it to be about us. I'm, Nihad, yeah, I can see you, you want to like that. How do we engage people to actually to participate in this? Actually, if you don't mind, David, can I bring Robin Spinks, who's here with us, um, just to say a few words about that? Because I think um, other RNIB and, and him as, as a partner sets a fantastic example of how they've enabled Alana. Yeah, thanks, Neha. Robin Spinks from RNIB. So, you know, from our point of view, this is all about choice. This is about spelling out to people what it is that they're signing up to. But more importantly than that, it's about demonstrating the benefits. And the benefits are huge. The benefits that can be had in terms of loneliness and isolation, 
um, but also in terms of being able to privately just access information in a way that works for you at a time that works for you. So, you know, I think, I think to Chris's point as well, it's about creating almost a mesh of solutions that work for you as an individual. What we want to do is to promote choice, promote independence, and above all else, to enable people to lead the life that they want to live. And AI has got an incredibly important role to play there. We need to be sensitive and we need to be careful about people's apprehensions, but we can do that. We can take them on a journey. And I think, hence, this project, we're building from the ground up the solution with the community. So at every stage, there are people involved in determining what, what, what's appropriate, what's a good thing to be doing, what would be helpful, what, how could the experience be made better? So it's putting user engagement right at the heart of the process. Thanks, Robin. Klaus, yeah, I mean, you're from a DPO, so this is, you're, you're really, this is really yeah, important yeah. to you. I agree, I agree. We have to see the, we have to see the benefits that, that can come out of uh, the use of AI. But on the other side, we have also to see uh, what, what are the dangers, yeah? Uh, data, okay. Yeah? If, it's, if it's free, you pay me for data. That's, that's yeah. <laughs> nothing is free, yeah? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm using a free app, if I'm using Google, for example, I'm paying with my data. Yeah? Uh, the, the thing is, uh, what is my influence? How can I influence that the, the, the data is used in the right way? When I'm okay with it, that the data is used for building uh, a customized system by AI, for example, for using, let's say, banking or other services, yeah, why not, yeah? But it has to be within my, within my uh, ability to, to say yes or no. That's the thing, what, what, what I think is, is really important. And we see it now at, at, in, in, in one special thing, for example, in recruitment. Automated recruit, recruitment does not work because you have the bias in the data, yeah? and you know all these this, this examples from a big company where you have, uh, at the end, only 25 to 35-year-old uh, white male persons in the, in, the, in the last stage of the recruitment. Yeah? Uh, and there is no solution inside for me now at the moment which can provide us with a real secure heaven, haven uh, to, to, to be to heaven. Yeah, heaven <laughs> to, be, <laughs> to say, okay, it works. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> the, the, my, 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 my initial point to, to enter into this, into the thing was I read a book from an American uh, socialist, uh, so, sociologist, 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 blah, 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 uh, Eubank, yeah, automating inequality. Yeah? <clears throat> and this was for me the, the first point to, to look a little bit deeper into this, into this thing. Uh, you have to see both sides of the coin. Yeah. Yeah? And, and, and Chris, I mean, we've, we've heard from Robin and we've heard from Klaus about what the DPOs might want to do, but what do you what do you want from people with disabilities to make this work for them? As, as you were talking, uh, uh, an expression about the nothing, nothing about us without us um, the, the, came in my head. If you don't include us, it'll happen to us. <laughs> um, the, it's really a factor of of, of engage, yeah. get involved, say what say what's broken, say what's working, help us understand how to make the process the processes better, help us understand how to make the systems better. We can only do this by working together us working together here, us working together with, with the, the communities, only then can we understand what needs to be fixed, what needs to be changed, what needs to be hidden. It has to happen together. Yeah. So, we, we have to, we, go on, we'll, go, we'll give you 30 seconds, then we're gonna have to stop and then come to the end. I, I, just, I just think maybe we, we can just also answer the question, I think we'll all, all agree on this, but like just in one word, um, transparency and honesty. Um, I think there's a big difference between compliance and really um, caring about the engagement and being transparent about what you're doing, what data you're collecting, what you're doing with that data and why. And, um, and that's just been, um, it, it makes things a lot more challenging as, you know, particularly as a startup when you're, ha you have limited resources and putting these extra efforts to be so transparent and, and, you know, honestly conveying, you know, um, you know, everything as much as possible, what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but that extra investment I think is, um, 
I, I know now is, is just so crucial ultimately in successfully engaging um, you know, the end users, which is of course ultimately um, crucial to successfully you know, commercializing and having an impact. Thank you. I, 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 want in the, I think one of the things that's come across to me is that this discussion, this debate, this dialogue is gonna be so important over the coming years. And for us as organizations working with people with disabilities, we're gonna to have to engage in that debate, which means we're gonna to have to develop our own expertise. We can't do this from a position of ignorance. And one of the challenges I would say to, if you're working in, dis in the disability field, you need to read and think about the potential impact of artificial intelligence on your products, your services, and on the people we're here to serve. People with disabilities, you need to think about what do I want from this situation. And in that spirit of dialogue, I just want to give an opportunity for anybody who would like to make a comment. You don't need to tell me your name. Please don't tell me a long description of what you do and where you do it, but a comment about the issue. And I want to give anybody who would like to make a comment at this point the opportunity to do so. Yeah. Well, Kate's artificial intelligence uh, suggestion... Can I, can I ask you just to slip your mic down, uh, your mask uh, down? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, just to help. Thank you. Um, thanks. An idea would be, uh, Mr. Brennis, uh, concerning security questions, just to include the cybersecurity expert community on all handicap products. We had before, in Luxembourg, we had before COVID, for example, nurses who came to the HEC-LU and asked for help to test uh, the hospital equipment about security. So that could be an additional help. Just to, and that also helps the company because companies working on solutions for handicapped people or in healthcare, a lot of times so they are not aware on the other side of the security issues. That could help a lot, yep. also on the data. Thank you. Any other comments? Just wave your arm high in the air if you, if you want to comment, because the lights are very bright. No? Okay, where, where? sorry, I can't, I can't see. Um, oh, right down there, Robin, sorry. I think just one kind of overarching point for me is the question we've all got to ask is about any technology, how can it make every day better for people with disabilities? And the answer to that is genuinely supplied by people with disabilities themselves. So that's what we've got to remember. There's a lot of fear around, there's a lot of apprehension around data, but we've got to, we've got to kind of take a bigger view. How can it make people's lives better? How can it give people a more fulfilled daily life, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the bottom line for me. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna close off here. I wanna leave you with two thoughts, um, uh, one of which is not quite so serious. The first one is, as we said, AI is happening already. In the town I live, uh, during the pandemic, um, they began to make, use robotic delivery agents. So up and down our pavements, there were little robots that trundle uh, from the stores, and the takeaway food stores, delivering, making deliveries into the community. For the elderly, for people with disabilities, at a time when it was really difficult to get things delivered, these robots delivered the essentials. They used AI to map out the routes, they use sensors, they avoid obstacles. Any of this sound familiar as things that we would like to see in the future? If you come to my town, I'll show you the robots up and down the street. And I want to leave you with the second thing, and how AI ruined one of my favorite jokes. Um, I was sent a, a video about three years ago, and it was after I'd, I'd, I'd expanded about how great it was to have automatic captions. I said, they said, have a look at this one and think what it's like as a deaf person. And the video was an interview in which the interviewer was describing how wonderful an, an Australian pianist was because of the quality of his performance and willingness to perform in, in front of any audience. There was one word in the auto captions which was not correctly transcribed. Yeah. It made quite a difference to the video. So I came back to it three years later and what really annoyed me, and this is YouTube's fault, the captions had got so much better that that had been corrected. I can't use it with anyone anymore. It's such a shame. Sorry. Thank you. And with that thought in mind, thank you very much to everyone. Thank you so much to our panel for such a discussion. 
uh, and look forward to continuing the discussion in the future. Thank you, everybody.